Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Decision Desk HQ's Let Me Finish. We are joined today by uh, Reese Gorman from Notice and Catherine Swartz from Notice as well. Um, I'm Audrey Fallberg, and I'm a political reporter with National Review. Um, we're going to kick things off by talking about Reese Gorman's great interview over Arizona, very cool dateline in a story um, with uh, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. He talked to him a little bit about some of the struggles he's having um, with his VP rollout. Talk to me about what you address with him and how the Trump campaign is addressing some of the you know comments he made several years ago about childless cat ladies, how he's responding to it. Yeah, 100%. So basically, we kind of just talked. I brought up, obviously, has not been the smoothest rollout. And he acknowledged that. He acknowledged that, I mean, this is something that's happened to a number of vice presidential candidates in the past. Um, he specifically referred to Dick Cheney and to Mike Pence, to whenever they were announced as the running mates, the amount of onslaught of attacks that they kind of endured. Trump still has confidence in him. Trump still is, he said that him and Trump still have a good relationship and they're going to have a good relationship through November and hopefully going to him that four years later when they're in the White House. And this is something that he, they're not, he's not overly worried. Uh, Sources in the Trump campaign obviously have also kind of acknowledged the fact that this has not been the smoothest rollout. But again, they're not overly worried about kind of these past comments. Um, and their thinking is it's kind of in the grand scale of oppo. Um, there's significantly worse things that um, could have hit a vice presidential candidate. And so they're thinking that they could kind of weather the storm, which they have been. I mean, Vance has been polling a good amount of people at his rallies. He's really honed in his stump speech. He's getting a lot more comfortable. I went to three separate rallies with him um, over the week. We had two in Nevada, one in Phoenix. And the crowd was energized. There was quite a bit of people. There were 3,000 people in his Vegas rally, 25 in his Reno rally, at 1,500 in Phoenix with another 2,500 that were approximately 2,500 that were turned away at the door. I remember when we were driving in with the motorcade into the rally, the line was stretched down the street. Um, and so this is kind of just their thing. It's like, we're just going to get them on the road as much as possible. They're also planning on getting them in front of a lot of media, doing a lot of media interviews. And that's kind of just the plan. It's just to kind of go through, kind of get them in front of TVs, get them in front of interviews and all that stuff. And that's kind of what he's, their thinking is. Mm -hmm. Now, Reese, when we saw, when we heard that J.D. Vance was the pick at the convention, the conventional takeaway was this pick, you know, projects Trump, the Trump campaign's confidence that they've got this thing in the bag. Obviously, a lot has changed. There have been a lot of different lurches to the roller coaster ever, ever since that convention, right? Catherine, feel free to jump in here as well. But Reese, I mean, one thing that really caught my eye was Wednesday during a uh, Trump sit down interview, that NABJ panel interview. He said something along the lines of, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, the historically speaking, the VP pick doesn't really matter. Um, you know, we've heard Trump campaign advisors say this as well. Um, did that did that comment surprise you? Um, you know, when he was asked whether he has full confidence in Vance, he didn't immediately say yes. I mean, he he seemed as if he is confident, but, you know, he went on this kind of long meandering, um, you know, response. How much does this VP pick really matter? And um, what what do you think Trump's response to this new cycle suggests that you know he he may be feeling about his pick yeah i i think this is something that i mean it was a little surprising to hear him say that it was kind of and i i asked fans about these comments as well i asked him I was like hey like did donald trump said this that he said people don't vote for the vice president they vote for the top of the ticket and trying to find the exact quote here but vance kind of said that he thinks that i mean he's like that's what trump has said this is something that kind of a position that Trump has had for a significant number of time while, and that it's he also kind of agrees with it. He said that the people aren't going to be voting for JD Vance; they're going to be voting for Donald Trump. And he said they doesn't think that's a knock on him specifically. He says that he just thinks it's a position that Trump has held for a while, and that he agrees with. He said whoever Harris picks, they're not going to be voting for whether it's Josh Shapiro, Tim Waltz, whatever. But they're going to be voted for Harris on the top of the ticket. And so I think that, that is kind of the thinking with both Trump and Vance um, kind of had just through my conversations, especially with the um, Trump running mate. Just to jump in on Vance's framing of that as well, you know, one thing that I have heard from different strategists, particularly in the Rust Belt states, 
uh, is kind of pushing back against that framing. Uh, and this is from Republican and Democratic strategists who I've talked to that are saying, Vance, that decision by Trump, of course, that was an intentional choice there, given that he had other candidates like Marco Rubio, Glenn Youngkin, that would have brought something different to the table. But when it comes to the Democratic side and positioning of a VP, Harris, in many ways to voters, especially in these swing states, is still an unknown, uh, given her differences uh, from her presidential run to her vice presidency, being a part of the Biden administration with, with Trump and what he represents, people for the most part have their positions on Trump. They know who he is, they know what he stands for. So in that way, a vice presidential candidate isn't bringing as much to the table. But for someone like VP Harris, that people are still trying to figure out who is she, who are her positions separate from Biden, a VP candidate could actually signal quite a bit about what that means uh, in terms of her priorities. So, Catherine, this is a good segue to our, our next topic. Um, you you've been you know reporting on this on this topic. I mean, what do you think? Uh, what are you hearing from Kamala Harris's inner circle in terms of who she's going to pick? You know, obviously her her uh, planned rally for Philadelphia on Tuesday, I believe, is raising a lot of eyebrows that she's already got her sights set on Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. Is that what you're hearing? And if so, what would that kind of reflect about how she's looking about her path to 270? Well, what I would say about the rally being in Pennsylvania, where she will announce her VP on Tuesday, don't read into the tea leaves too much about what that means for it being Shapiro. Looking at previous vice presidential announcements, they don't uh, correlate with the state where the candidate's from. I think more than anything, it's just a signal of how vital Pennsylvania will be uh, for the path to the presidency for either candidate. But uh, this weekend, we've seen uh, Governor Shapiro, also Tim Waltz, uh, Andy Bashir and Pete Buttigieg all canceling their previously scheduled engagements for the weekend. That's kind of showing these four are in the interview stage when it comes to VP Harris and her pick, but there's also a couple other candidates who are still on the table. So I spent some time in Pennsylvania this week. I was in Montgomery County for Governor Shapiro's joint appearance with Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, he was promoting Harris there. There was no discussion whatsoever of a VP pick. However, if you're looking at that crowd, if you're looking at the message, to me, it's clear the pitch that he is making as a VP, which is he is a candidate who has uh, bipartisan popular support, both in his previous elections in the state, as well as his favorability rating right now, which rests at 61 percent. So mm -hmm. when you look at his policies as governor, he is trying to position some of those more bipartisan efforts as something he could bring to a ticket. Catherine, speaking of that bipartisan appeal, I mean, he is seen as much more moderate than some of these other pick, um, you know, potential picks. Somebody else like Tim Walls has a much more progressive governing record. Reese, feel free to jump in here as well. Um, what, do you think that if she goes with Shapiro, there will be pushback from progressives? Well, there has been some pushback that we have seen on Governor Shapiro's stances, particularly around Israel. Uh, he had called for the University of Pennsylvania to shut down a pro-Palestinian uh, campus protest, uh, a sit-in on that campus. However, other candidates who are in the running have similar stances as well when it comes to the issue of Israel. They perhaps just haven't dealt with it as directly, not having had a large student protest at the, the state where they're governing and leading. So when it comes to that issue, there certainly is some pushback from Shapiro. But again, I just point to what Pennsylvania means and stands for. So there's some speculation of how much would a VP actually affect the final presidential results uh, looking at past data. But what I am hearing again and again from strategists in Pennsylvania and outside is, hey, this is a numbers game. Pennsylvania has 19 electoral votes. And even if Shapiro makes a small difference in that number for Harris, that small difference could mean winning Pennsylvania and winning the presidency. Now we're going to move on to our last topic, um, which is, you know, obviously we've spoken a lot about running mates. Um, I'm interested in how Kamala Harris has done her rollout. It's been pretty, pretty smooth. Um, you know, as I believe Catherine alluded to earlier, you know, on the on the debate stage, and we spoke about this a little bit last week on the 2020 Democratic primary debate stage, you know, Kamala Harris came out in support of some pretty progressive ideas, right? She said she was going to support single payer um, health care you know, ban fracking, um, lots of other, you know, field day for uh, progressives, right? Um, you know, we're seeing in, in recent days that through a spokeswoman, she is reversing a lot of those 
um, prior positions. She says she no longer um, supports a mandatory federal jobs guarantee. You know, she's reversed her um, pledge to to ban fracking, right? Um, to me, this has been politically smart. You know, she hasn't had to go in front of a camera to talk about it. Um, you know, most of her rollout has been through these, you know, 20, 30 minute speeches at, at rallies. Um, and right now it seems to really be working for her, right? Um, there have been so many, uh, you, we had a, an assassination attempt on the president. We had this disastrous debate. Then we had this party, the party's immediate rallying behind Kamala Harris. Um, you know, the, the momentum seems to be shifting back and forth between both candidates. Right now, it seems to be in Harris's corner. Um, that will probably continue in terms of polling over the next couple weeks, realistically speaking, when she gets that extra boost from from the VP pick and the, and the media momentum that surrounds it and then going into the convention as well. Um, I'm curious what whether you what you guys think of her reversal of these you know Democratic primary debate positions, whether it matters and how you guys have, you know, whether you guys have talked to Republicans about how they're going to continue to hit her on the trail. Yeah, I, I think I think it matters. Um... A significant amount. I mean, I think that these positions that she took are not widely popular with the base. It was popular when she was having to win the Democrat. Pro- I mean, they're popular with the base. They're not popular with the best short of America. I mean, these are pe- things that she said that she had to take when she was trying to win the Democrat primary. Obviously, she was able to kind of um, forego that with Biden dropping out and going through a nominating process now. Um, and so she's having to moderate her stance a little bit. I mean, you see this happen all the time in just congressional primaries. Uh, two, where in the primary, they'll run what, really far to the right or to the left just to get the nomination, and then they'll try to sit her out when it comes to the general election. Uh, we're just seeing that done over a four-year span now. I think it won't fully resonate unless she comes out and specifically takes and walks back some of these past stances that she's had. Um, and I think that's something that the Trump campaign also is really looking for. You, you see, like, every one of these stories that comes out about anonymous staffers saying, oh, she doesn't support that position anymore, what have you. Um, it's really hit hard by the Trump campaign being like, oh, like, maybe is she ever going to come out and say these things? And-, and just from my reporting, I kind of want to point out how moderate Democrats are feeling about this, too, as opposed to just Republicans, where there is a bit of concern right now of wait and see what is she going to be saying and doing between now and the DNC when it comes to her views. So we've seen a groundswell of fundraising dollars of volunteer support. I've talked to some congressional candidates who have already seen that trickle down uh, going to their personal campaigns. But there is kind of this concern about those 2019 stances and how strongly she will go out against them. I was talking to Will Rollins earlier this week. He's running uh, as a Democrat in California's 41st district, one of the closest races in the country. And he really hammered down to me when I talked to him she needs to focus on inflation, she needs to focus on the border, and she needs to focus on crime. Getting back to those three issues, the kitchen table issues that people care about, and what he and strategists I talked to that day were saying are the issues that President Trump has been able to dominate in the conversation. So it's about having a message on the economy, for example, that's pointing out what the Biden administration done, but also recognizing that, hey, inflation is something that is directly affecting people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that concludes our show today. Um, Before we wrap things up, Reese and Catherine, talk to talk to us about any stories you've written that that you uh, think reader or listeners should uh, should should read or anything that you're working on. Yeah, um, I have my interview with uh, Senator J.D. Vance is currently on notice.org and otus.org. There's two separate stories on that matter. And they're there right now. And I would recommend people go and read them because I think I think I'm biased, but I think they're pretty interesting. So uh, I'm biased as well since I work with Reese, but I agree. Catherine, what are you working on? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, I spent some time up in Pennsylvania this week, uh, both in Montgomery County and in Scranton, Biden's hometown, talking with working class blue collar voters about how they're feeling about Harris, how they're feeling about the change. So that reporting, uh, that story should be up soon. And I really just want to highlight that kind of group that I'm focused on here is talking with those voters that were aligned with Biden, aligned with his stances, and just don't really know how they feel about Harris yet. Catherine, I was also in Pennsylvania earlier this week for a Trump rally in Harrisburg. His return, first, his first return to Pennsylvania after the attempt on his life, um, where he gave a very long, long characteristic speech. 
um, that suggested he is not maybe as disciplined as some allies would like him to be. Um, with that, thank you so much for watching another episode of Let Me Finish. Um, please make sure to head over to decisiondeskhq.com for all of your polling information. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you next week.